A star-spangled sky is a truly amazing and tremendous sight. These lights twinkling in the night have charmed humans since times immemorial and inspired them to dream and strive for new discoveries. However, there are places in our galaxy where the star count in the sky is several times higher than that in the Earth's sky. These aren't the dim and cool lights we're used to seeing either, but an exceptionally dazzling multitude of large stars. It is hard to imagine what it looks like, but this is what the universe appears to be, seen from the center of one of the largest superstar clusters in our galaxy. Westerland 1 A star cluster is a group of stars which formed from one and the same gigantic cloud of interstellar matter. These stars are practically identical in terms of their chemical composition and age. The system they form is bound by gravity forces. Star clusters fall into either of these two categories, which are the main varieties, open and globular clusters. Open star clusters are products of stellar nurseries evolution. The latter's are areas of cosmic gas where stars are actively born. That is why the clusters here are mainly comprised of young stars and great amounts of interstellar hydrogen. Gravity forces between them are comparatively feeble, which leads to an open cluster's disintegration several hundred million years after its formation, which of course is mere seconds in astronomical terms. Some of its former members still stick together in their joint movement in space thus forming a stellar stream, while others break away from their group to become sole masters of their own destiny. Over 1,100 open star clusters have been pinpointed in our galaxy, and incidentally, it appears to be just a tiny portion of their overall count. Globular clusters are larger and denser than open ones, and consist of old and not very massive stars. The average distance between the stars there is four to six light months. As for their masses, these may reach a million times that of the Sun. The Milky Way contains not less than 150 star clusters of this type, and the Andromeda Galaxy over 500. Open clusters are comparatively modest in size, but the star count in some of them reaches thousands. These objects are referred to as superstar clusters. The largest of them are thought to eventually turn into globular ones, all it will take is waiting around for a few billion years or so until the most massive stars there have burned out and exploded. One of the largest superstar clusters in our galaxy is one referred to as Westerland 1. It was spotted back in 1961 by Swedish astronomer Bengt Westerland, but for a long while remained largely understudied as it is quite difficult to observe. The distance from the cluster's center to the solar system has been estimated at approximately 10,000 to 15,000 light years. Staggering though this figure may seem, Westerlund 1 is in fact one of our closest superstar clusters. That is why it is crucial to observe it, to bring our understanding of stellar evolution processes to a whole new level. The diameter of Westerlund 1 measures around 7 light years. Astoundingly, this area, which is really tiny in astronomical terms, is literally crammed with thousands of stars with a total mass of about 63,000 solar masses. Some straightforward calculations show that distances between the major members of the cluster are just several light months. As for binary system components, they are much closer to each other than that. Due to incredible density of the stars in the cluster, and the clouds of interstellar gas the stars are shrouded in, it is impossible to distinguish the exact sources of light here, as the thousands of stars this light comes from are too densely packed. This greatly interferes with observations and doesn't allow the observer to count the stars. That is why the exact star count in Westerland 1 remains to be gauged. Among them, the following types of stars have already been pinpointed. Six yellow hypergiants, four red supergiants, 24 wolf Rayet stars and a supergiant with a highly peculiar emission spectrum. Supposedly, it formed on collision of two massive stars. In addition, there is a great number of hot blue giants and an X-ray pulsar discovered among the stars in the cluster. The pulsar is an anomalous object, a neutron star spinning with a mind-boggling speed. The binary star count is also quite high in Westerland 1. 
this fact may be accounted for by the high density of the cluster's objects. All the superstar cluster's objects are posited to have formed at around one and the same time. However, depending on the type of stars, they differ in terms of their age too. To start with, according to today's theory of stellar evolution, red supergiants cannot be younger than 4 million years. Wolf Rayet stars, on the other hand, which are in the final stage of their life cycle by definition, are remarkably numerous in the cluster. Their life expectancy is known almost never to have been over 5 million years. Thus, the age of Westerland 1 is quite accurately estimated at a mere 4 to 5 million years, which in essence is seconds in astronomical terms. At approximately the same time it was forming, first Australopithecus and saber-toothed tigers roamed the Earth, and all that had been left of dinosaurs by then was just their fossilized remains. Mathematical modeling of the cluster's formation shows that the cluster may have contained 50 to 150 heavy stars that would have depleted their resources by now, and so would have come to the final stage of their life cycle. Given the estimates are correct, on average there would have been supernovae every 10,000 years in the course of the past million years. As we know, the heavier a star, the faster it comes to the end of its life cycle and goes supernova, after which it leaves a black hole, neutron star or white dwarf. However, to date only one object like that has been detected. It is thought that many supermassive stars would have turned into black holes, but these are rather difficult to spot today. The superstar cluster Westerlund 1 contains one of the largest stars known today, designation Westerlund 126. Since it is rather difficult to observe it, its radius has been gauged at roughly 1,500 to 2,500 times that of the Sun. If its radius is closer to the bigger margin, Westerlund 126 may be the biggest star known to mankind. However, the radius is more likely to lie closer to the lower margin and measure slightly over 1,500 times that of the Sun. Even so, if its center were to be theoretically placed in that of the Sun, Westerland 126 would cover all the planets, reaching as far as the orbit of Jupiter. The supergiant's luminosity is approximately 380,000 times that of the Sun although its surface temperature is comparatively low, just around 3000 Kelvin. The star's mass hasn't been gauged yet, but today's perception of stellar evolution allows us to assume that it may be around 20 solar masses. Another unusual object in the cluster is a magnetar with a name like a tongue twister. It is also the most powerful source of X-ray radiation in that area of space. Located approximately 16,000 light years from the Sun, it is a neutron star whose rotation period is about 10 seconds. Incidentally, this is rather slow in comparison to other objects of this class. Those rotate several times a second. Given that all the stars in the cluster formed at around one and the same time, it would have taken the star that was the progenitor of this magnetar just 5 million years to deplete its thermonuclear fuel. This means that when it was born, its mass should have been not less than 40 solar masses. However, in that case, it should have left a black hole rather than a neutron star after going supernova. It transpires that the progenitor star had to unaccountably lose up to 95% of its mass before going supernova. One of the possible answers to this riddle may lie in the fact that the object may have originated from a binary star rather than a single one. By spinning around their common mass center at an astounding rate, the system's components had a chance of actively exchanging material. At some point, the supernova would have scattered most of this material in the space around it, while the second component would have been ejected from the system. The star Westerlund 1-5, which is located comparatively close to the magnetar, may well have been that very component, although it is not certain. Unfortunately, chances of discovering any planets in the superstar cluster Westerlund 1 are thin. First of all, the stars the cluster is comprised of are too young for any planets to form in their environs. This curious process takes hundreds of millions of years at the very least. Secondly, even billions of years later, when the cluster supposedly turns into a globular one, it is hardly worthwhile to anticipate any objects to be born there that would potentially be capable of sustaining life.
The close proximity of large and heavy stars makes the potential planet's orbits unstable. Moreover, in certain circumstances, a massive neighbor relatively close to a star system may actually destroy it completely. Besides, thousands of active stars concentrated in a small area of space create a remarkably powerful radiation background. Frequent flares of supernovae occurring in this crammed space may cause harmful gamma-ray bursts which destroy any life on a planet's surface. Chances are that even if mankind finds a way to cover interstellar distances, clusters will still remain deadly areas for quite a while. Either way, all these speculations don't put a damper on the charms and beauty of the starry heavens. The cosmos is a limitless source of knowledge about the universe for scientists and a source of inspiration for artists. For all we know, at some point it may become a new home for mankind, and while this time hasn't yet come, we will just keep making new informative episodes. Let's keep in touch.